today uh, anonymous are you still there i'm still here perfect so we were both in saskatchewan enjoying this weird situation with covid19 still being a global and local issue with most countries in the world at this point uh, having some degree of lockdown literally billions of people having their lives impacted i'm just gonna very quickly load up the john hopkins university to give the world a little bit of a context of where we are in this pandemic so as of today, we've got, I'm noticing it, it starts getting a little slow the higher these numbers get, but we're at about 2.3 million people affected and quite a few deaths on top of that. So now as far as your experience in Anonymous, you are a parent, uh, you've got, we heard the children in the background a little bit there, uh, but before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about the impact on parents as far as how COVID is affecting parents in Saskatchewan. So what is your experience on the school's alternative that has been set up? And how, let's start with that. Right now, we have to keep our kids. Oh, I can hear feedback. Uh, do you think me? Uh, back up, uh, does that make sense? As in you're hearing your own voice echoing back, or? Yeah, I'm hearing my own voice. Uh, okay, I'm going to try to get behind the uh, microphone, or behind the uh, speaker. Hold, hold on. It might help a little bit. There's going to be an echo either way, but I'll try to minimize that for you. Battery low. Oh, there goes our second recording device. Oh, well. Okay, so uh, is this a little bit better? Let me ch check. Yeah, so that sounds a little bit. Okay. So I guess the, the question is, as a parent, and you are now responsible for the education of the children in your life to a much greater extent than you used to be. And so how has that experience been going for you? Right now, they're cooped up at home. They, it's very hard to, oh, that's the feedback, that lag uh, that I'm hearing. It's throwing me off. I can't. Go ahead. You, you sure we can't use any like a chatting program? I mean, like the problem's probably going to be the same because on on my end, there has to be a way to record it, right? And so it's yeah, you're you're feeding into the the what the open air, uh, so that a, another microphone or pair of microphones can pick it up. Uh, one of them just died. I'm gonna just try to get some juice into this one. I think. All right, technical difficulties. I wonder if this is actually going out live because it's saying is sorry, we're having trouble with playing this video. So I have no idea if this is actually going out or not. It says uh, recording, so I'm assuming so. Right now, I have my kids on at home. They're not really doing anything. It's my older one I watches a lot of TV. My well, I, I work uh, in the basement, and my wife during the day is laid off, but she's taking care of the two kids. She has to try to do some activities with them, but she's she gets bogged down with cooking and cleaning during the day. And so, of the the amount of time, like normally, the children would go to school on a before this happened. Uh, what like eight 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 o'clock nine o'clock yes and then come back kind of like three two thirty three something around that time five oh okay so and then i would take my older one to the gym with me to drop in child mining so i could work out and and she could play on the indoor ymca play structure and of course gyms being closed now too they oh we, we still have a uh, audience good so uh, with that now, instead of there being a whole workday worth of activities for them, allowing you to 
go to work, that sort of thing. Now with them at home, you're, you still have to work, right? And so there's only so much activity that you can provide to them, given you, you're still working in the basement. Now, as you, you mentioned, your wife is either laid off or like a, uh, not able to, to do much other than helping with the kids. Now, is she, has she found other things to do outside of just helping out with the kids or has it purely been helping out with the kids? It's only been helping out with the kids and we have more potted plants inside our house right now as a craft activity. And so now with that, it does seem, or at least you were mentioning before we started that there is a lack of learning opportunities that you have at home and that like have, have your kids logged into the online material at all yet or has it just purely been you providing whatever they've been what kind of instruction have they been receiving well they don't attend actual elementary school so they don't they just have some rough lessons from like uh, child care but it's early childhood education but there's no structured activities available and so the, both of them are, are fairly the, young then if they're still doing kind of early or easy stuff Yes. Okay. One, the older one is four. The youngest, younger one is uh, one years old. And, and so, what are they missing? What What is the the school system with it missing? What exactly is missing in their lives? Their friends. Their friends. Okay. And so, given that they're they're still like too young to do, be able to do much with friends online, they've been basically just being friends with being close to you and your wife, and kind of soaking up time on that side. So you mentioned that there's like a lack of socialization there. And so that is definitely one thing that's on right now, that there is a kind of relationship that you have with your parents and being able to, to talk to them, to be able to communicate, to play, have fun with them, etc. But it is definitely also a, an important thing for, for children to be around children their own age and to be able to learn that way. So now as far as, you, you, because there's two of them, have, have they been playing together at all? Or is it mostly just one doing one thing, one doing another thing? They're separated in age and the youngest one is too young to really participate in the same communicative activities. Uh, like our younger daughter is just does things and the older one has to avoid the younger one because the younger one is a baby. Right. Okay. Makes sense. And so now the younger one, would that be like uh, preschool or? Kindergarten or, or how, how would the younger one normally be at school then? Or? Infant. Infant. Oh, like really, really infant. Okay. She just started uh, before the, the child care was closed. Oh, okay. That, that makes sense. So with the child care being closed then, is as far as the... So right now your wife's time is basically taken up by these these two kids like you're taking care of your family but it's it's like we're we're all in this period of time right now where we're helping out and making do with the the households and the, the resources we have but we're not as much helping out other people or at least it's much more difficult to to engage with other people now you're still working now but other other than your work is there any connection you have to the outside community the outside world that you have or is it just purely the kids maybe going for groceries that sort of thing i've been doing zoom meetups with friends so that's at least something right <laughs> now and ps4 gaming and say again friends. sorry gaming on the ps4 okay uh, so but the the children like the the ps4 is there anything on the ps4 for them or is it purely more for older older children that sort of thing my friend's children are going to do minecraft at around four years of age but my daughter shows no interest no interest in minecraft yet probably for the better <laughs> but no interest in any video <laughs> interest yeah. now as far as the lack of guess, social access in their friends now do you see any impact like observable impact of that i notice uh, with other kids that uh, have been in my life where if they don't have social connection with children their own age they tend to be uh, like one girl specifically the only person in her uh, social life for a little while was a much younger relative and so she tended to be to act like the age of the younger child rather than her own age and she was old enough to be responsible on a, a much higher level than she was because she could see that the younger child was kind of get, getting away with not really doing anything, etc. Do you see anything like that with, with your children? Uh, no, it's still too young to comment on that. Fair enough. Fair still... So we have one comment from the peanut gallery, quote, seems like the way that my children were raised in the era before the internet, unquote. <laughs> so, I mean, it, to some extent, but I mean, before the internet, children were allowed to go out and run around outside. Now, as far as your situation goes, is there an outside to run around? Like, do you have much of a yard? Have you been able to like go for walks? We went or... for a walk. We went, uh, but 
we, we have a yard. I remember when I was growing up, uh, that we were allowed to roam free. Societal expectations changed so that a parent always had to be in supervision of their children. Right. And has that begun to change a little bit, given the COVID situation, or is that just as strong as ever? That's still as strong as ever. Good to know. Likely, uh, if some neighbor will see, if they see a roaming four-year-old, they'll call social services, uh, just like uh, without the pandemic going on. Huh. Which, I mean, t- to me, it's really a sad thing, especially here in Saskatchewan, because there are cases where social services is really needed. And like, I, I haven't been connected close enough to, to know if it, it's still the case, but I would su- suspect it's still the case. When I was in high school, there were definitely children being forced into, for example, prostitution here in Saskatoon, in at least one of the areas downtown. In one of the schools, the teachers were were seeing this happen and kind of powerless to stop it. I would suspect, especially given the the last show where they were talking about the gangs going younger and younger for finding girls for that purpose, that the there are issues that child services needs to be there for. And yet what is their resources being taken up with, right? It's the complaints of, oh, this parent is letting their children roam free to go to the playground or something like that, right? It's kind of absurd on that side. But as far as the work that teachers had been doing, so there's providing a space for children to be social that is definitely not present now. There's the, on on the learning side, so you mentioned that they're not really learning all that much with you. So what would the teachers have been doing that they're unfortunately not able to do that you can kind of tell like what is the difference there my guess is that they're a stranger authority figure and so the kids are able to listen at the first time more rather than trying to renegotiate and my teacher friends have also agreed with that saying that when they've tried to teach their own kids they they see their parents more as parents rather than as teachers so it's a losing battle the children will fall into line with the stranger especially if the stranger is an authoritative one right like it, there's definitely yeah. a, a difference between a, a stranger just telling you to do something and a stranger that your parents have like in some way socially signified that oh hey listen to this man right as opposed to just a stranger right and i think they know what the role of the teacher they, they know that the teacher has a singular role but if you're a parent trying to teach they see you in a different roles and especially if there's two of you right because there's always the question of if you know, dad tells you to do something you can go to your mom and try to like renegotiate down from that side if dad is being a stick in the mud right and so yes there's constantly this re- renegotiating taking place and that's, that's something that like I didn't really fully appreciate as much until I started working with children in terms of how creative they can be in not doing what you want them to do and how many different ways they will squeak out of. If they don't want to do something, that they'll, they'll find a way to not do it. And teachers <laughs> have ways of, of dealing with this and they're, I mean, they go to school specifically to, to learn how to get around this problem. And most parents, I mean, I'm sure there, there's some... A level of knowledge and experience and understanding that you get just being a parent but there there's definitely also you do learn things to become a teacher and this is one of the things that you do you do pick up and so without teachers we're definitely missing that as well so we're slowly kind of adding up here all of the ways that teachers are important now have you heard much about the labor negotiations round that were going on before the covid started are you kind of in the loop at all on that they were close to striking uh, they were not happy with the deal that the province was sending out, mm-hmm. but and now the game has changed. Uh, the province are legitimately going to be poor uh, with all the borrowing that they're having to incur and all the lost tax revenue. That so I don't know what the teachers' position will be after after this year. So you expect because the the prov- like right now because of the federal government is spending money left, right, and center bailing out industry after industry, sending out uh, this year ERB payments to a lot of people, spending tons of money to try to get the economy at least to survive this crisis. That you expect that as a consequence of this, somewhere down the line, that there will be cutbacks and especially to things like education that are kind of classically what the government would normally be spending the money on provincially, kind of what I'm picking up here. Everyone else, there's going to be a large unemployment. And so the province will be able to use the hammer against the teacher saying, at least you have a job. Oh, okay. And it's going to work because if we're floating at 20% unemployment rate, that's, it's going to be valid. Uh, the, you, the teachers aren't going to have a, posi- a strong labor position to bargain. That makes sense. It, think- it, before, before it was probably, it was better, but like 
they could point to the province and say, you kept on enriching yourselves, but now it's a different situation. And, and I think a lot of us are going to be in that situation after we go back to work in terms of, like you said before we started to record, there's a, not a lot of jobs out there right now. There are some. Like, I went to SAS Jobs a couple of days ago, and, like, there are jobs. They're mostly high-skilled medical jobs. Like, if you're a nurse right now, I mean, you definitely have a job. But for the general <laughs> labor, and even things like uh, skilled labor like teachers, there is going to be a lot of people out of work, and a lot of people who could step into that role are going to be out of work. And so there's definitely going to be uh, some interesting times ahead as far as trying to figure out how to find jobs for all these people. But especially interesting that the skill level, there's a lot of skilled jobs out there that people can do and have been doing up until this crisis started. And there's really no reason why we couldn't just kind of start up again on a lot of those jobs. I mean, that's not what's going to happen. There is going to be a delay as the economy, like with businesses that are just shutting down, with the people just being broke and not being able to afford to, to purchase the products that people would be able to sell. But like the capacity is still there uh, for people to to produce, to uh, to know how to produce. That that stuff is not being lost, but it's the the way that our, uh, I guess the way the economy works is there is going to be a delay uh, before we can kind of pick things back up again, assuming we can get that far, right? And so, as far as, now in your specific role specifically, you've been able to manage to, to work online. So how has the working online been going for you? Is this something you were doing before? Uh, I, no, I wasn't doing it before. I, it, we previously had the, our, my management had the policy of wanting to work in the office, but that changed. Okay. And so now I work from home in the basement. And I don't mind it. I'm kind, I'm sort of introverted, so I like the quiet space. And without coworkers to distract, like, that, like no one comes into my cubicle. Do you find that you're getting more done, or is that uh, how is the working remotely and being able to have a, a sense of solitude been able to impact you uh, in terms of how much you're able to do? Um, or is it like mostly I limited by the other people? I can't fully gauge yet. We had a plan to go to South Korea in March 12th, and so I returned to work on April 1st. I canceled my vacation, so I've been back for a few weeks, and so there hasn't been really... I was on a staycation, but there wasn't huge amounts of work, so I, have, I can't really gauge right now if I'm more productive, but Makes sense. I do enjoy that no one can just barge into my cubicle. So do you expect that when things go back to normal, that if you found that you were actually more productive where you are, that they'd let you stay? Or do you think that you'd just be pulled back into the office with everyone else? I'd be pulled back into the office with everyone else. And I could sort of buy that because work is also a social place as well. And communication tends to be clear face to face when you can see the visually what the expression of a person's face. Makes sense. And so going back to the children and learning how to be, to be social. Now, it does seem that there is a level of being used to being around other people as well. And I know when I'm not around other people, and I'm not as introverted as some people, probably not as introverted as you, but when I go a long period of time without being around people, being around people is a little bit of a shock, right? Do you ever find that at all? Or like if you manage to be on your own for quite a while and then get back into or dragged into the office or something like that, do you see that as a the transition is a possible thing that is going to be kind of an added stressor or? Uh, I, I won't have a comment on that. I don't. I will be slowed down because it will be a little bit more uh, shooting the shit with coworkers. But fair enough. Because like uh, there'll be when we get back, there'll be a lot to catch up on as far as people who hadn't seen each other for quite a while in person. We won't be able to help catching up and talk. Small talk will definitely happen on that side. Yes. But I guess going back to the the labor side now, having despite that the the government is going to use the, the the masses of unemployed as an example to put pressure on the teachers. Now having had to live without the teachers for a while, do you see them differently at all? And or at least the work that they. Uh, I never lost my respect for them. I knew they were important. Uh, I felt better current government was devaluing teachers at the expense of more oil companies, I guess. Right. Uh, but that's the nature of conservative governments that we tend to be opposed to any 
government funded institutions. And it's also kind of interesting seeing Alberta in this because Alberta's definitely more tied to their oil. Like here in Saskatchewan, the SAS party is definitely tied to the oil industry very tightly. And there's a lot to be said about the priorities of the government uh, leaning to oil rather than education, say. But Alberta is definitely a more extreme version of that. And it's to the point where, like, they've got their war room where they put propaganda out for pro oil purposes. Uh, they've got subsidies of all kinds going into their oil fields. But what's also kind of interesting about this whole thing is the price of oil being so low. And I've seen things like, I think it's a, a barrel of monkeys toy of like plastic monkeys is more expensive than a barrel of Western crude oil. The, and that was quite a while ago. I think the price has actually dropped since then. So they're kind of chasing this dream of expensive oil and being willing to put more and more and more taxpayer dollars that I'm starting to wonder if we're going to get to the point, especially if this crisis continues to drag on, where we're going to see negative priced oil or free, possibly even free oil. <laughs> Because it's starting to become technically possible that they're already spending so much taxpayer dollars to make oil into this expensive thing that to go the next couple of steps, I mean, it would be more expensive, but maybe not more expensive than the COVID response generally. So, and I, I mean, I would have had trouble imagining before this past like week or two, just going to the pump with a vehicle and then filling up and not having to worry about paying. But this is starting to be possible, I think. <laughs> Do you see that at all, or is that still kind of a fantastic dream? Well, it is the... What is the conservative... President Alberta's conservative government's name? They keep... They merge, and every time a, I think it's a the, conservative party has it, like, on the future... Or or UPCs, or... A new party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that they will try to appeal to that base, the oil workers, because... But everyone else will start getting mad, because if they're, if they're subsidizing the wages of the oil field workers, they're gonna get passing. Why can't you just let them sink? This is a market economy, so sometimes a field, if there's no demand for it, you have to accept that they, you can't keep on trying to resurrect it like a zombie. And it'll probably come back at some point, but it's yeah. not the government's responsibility to try to keep it as a fundamental institution. Now, that being said, so like, it sounds like you're, you're fairly uh, critical of the conservatives generally. Now. As a public service, though, I mean, oil is a useful thing and does uh, do a, a good deal for the economy. Uh, if it were free, we were we would be able to do something like ration it, for example. And there's definitely a pathway to tapering down its use if the government is able to step in on a greater level. So if we wanted to, for example, deal more seriously with climate change, one way of approaching that might be to step one, uh, have the government gain full control over the oil fields. And as a way of getting that control might just be getting free oil for Albertans and, and convincing the oil workers to work that way. It would be kind of a weird way of doing the national energy program. Like the previous attempts tended to be more focused on getting money out of Alberta, but it seems like the, the other way around might actually work <laughs> in a strange little way of like getting money from the rest of Canada into Alberta to kind of convince them to slowly transition, but I don't know, maybe that, that's the wrong way to do it. And maybe we don't have time for that, who knows. Like, like oil is used for, I kind of just agree that oil can be phased out a little, like it's used for plastics, and plastics are stuff that don't degrade, that don't get eaten up. They're useful when you want it to last. Yeah, they're damaging in the, what's it called, the term where like, the, uh, the microplastics? A circle of life is a waste product where, it, yeah, um, but I'm trying to, they're not consumable, they're not biodegradable, so they don't, they just end up polluting their... Uh, they just slowly accumulate. Them, but you still, yeah, you still need them for, like, our cars are lighter because we are using plastics uh, in them, and so that saves on gas, and it will save on charging, using lithium batteries if you have an electric vehicle. There, you could also build some structures uh, out of it that last longer than wood. It's, it's a cheaper cost. So I don't know about uh, getting rid of oil, Fully because there are uses to, to creating it. Right. That, like and, in the medical world, it's also like a sterilizable thing, a substance that th you can use it in a lot of uh, situations that uh, without infecting a person when you're operating. In Which is actually something I've been learning a lot about is uh, this week as part of my epidemiology course, or how easy it is for infection to occur at hospitals. And like right now, there's 100,000 people a year, so less people that have died from COVID, but a lot of people in the United States alone 
that have died from infections that they've gotten at the hospital. So that these are infections that they would not have gotten otherwise, but because they went to the hospital, they got. And things like that you wouldn't expect uh, are kind of dependent on hospitals not passing this through uh, are things like heart surgery and cancer and uh, or chemotherapy and all kinds of things that basically everything that a hospital does to save someone's life or virtually all of it depends on these hospital transferred diseases not to to go through to them and the problem is is that our ways of dealing with it are going to be one antibiotics two like you said uh, either temporary one-use items or items that can be sterilized completely either designed with plastic or otherwise or kind of two just general cleanliness and hoping for the best and the problem is is that the antibiotic side is gradually losing effectiveness and it's not something that we can go okay well we'll just make some more kinds of antibiotics because we're already throwing tens of billions of dollars into finding more antibiotics and we're just not finding as many of them like we're still discovering them and there's still potential for antibiotics to be solving the problem of hospital there, go ahead there was one solution for the antibiotics problem though like as the bacteria got stronger and they're antibiotic resistant and their penicillin resistance they became weaker to phages uh, and we haven't really used bacterial phages to try to treat that kill off bacteria so so bacteria uh, phages and uh, so are it, viruses right that just specifically target bacteria yeah okay the, uh, harmless to humans but uh, but they kill yeah they target bacteria and so if uh, the bacteria get more resistant to antibiotics they're less resistant to bacteriophages but if they're more resistant to bacteriophages they're less resistant to antibiotics interesting so we train them to be strong against antibiotics so they're really weak right now against phages and so longer term we, we may have a, a kind of a way out now have you heard of how like close they yes. are to being able to ramp up these phages or is it just like proven There's to laugh a few, it but like some of the phages though like uh, even the youtube video that i was watching um for e coli the phage actually causes e coli is usually harmless until the phage actually targets uh, the cells and causes it to treat poison so not all phages are helpful okay because they could trigger the bacteria to emit toxins. So basically as a defense mechanism to keep itself alive against these phages, it re releases a toxin that just also happens to be toxic to us. Am I getting that right? I don't know. I'm not an expert. It could just be the virus that's creating, doing a chemical reaction that is releasing a lot of toxins. Okay, that, that's kind of good to know. And so, <laughs> and like those kinds of trade-offs are definitely involved in dealing with antibiotics generally. And th this is something that like, up until this week, I really didn't fully appreciate how important it is. Like I knew that it was important that if you get prescribed medication, you only do what the doctor says and you only use it for the purpose intended. Like you don't take it later. If you stop taking it, you gotta keep the doctor in the loop, that sort of thing. But one of the things that I learned kind of yesterday was that there is an optimal amount of medication of antibiotic medication for specific infections. So if you get sick, the doctor can know, okay, I, I can treat you with antibiotics that will, assuming it's a bacteria, of course, not a virus, that will, will help with this. But it turns out that that level, it's kind of like a, a selfish solution. It's a solution that is going to be optimal for your disease, but it's not an optimal level for treating the disease and preventing more antibiotic resistance. And if all doctors do this, which basically all doctors do, it guarantees long-term or even medium-term an increase in antibiotic resistance for that particular disease. And especially if that disease, whatever it is, whatever pathogen it turns out to be, can spread, then it pretty much guarantees the, the increase of resistance. So it's kind of, kind of an interesting thing to note that like our doctors are basically acting as though they're only treating one person when in fact they are treating all of us every time they prescribe medication to one person. And the same, of course, goes for when people take medication without a doctor's guidance. But they're not just treating themselves, but they're, they're changing the, the total mix of bacteria that it impacts the whole of the species. And the example they kind of gave was there are bacteria in Antarctica right now that are very, very far away, frozen or semi-frozen pools 
uh, entire continents away that are resistant to these antibacterial medications that are prescribed in, for example, the United States. And so, like, bacteria are not only able to travel, but are, are able to learn on a, a global scale uh, based on how we're treating them locally here. So it's kind of a, an interesting topic to, to kind of go into, but do you have any more comment on that? Only that uh, I don't think the doctors have a like any way to handle uh, that their actions can impact uh, the global state of things. Uh, and I, I don't think it would be fair to them to be able to say, oh, maybe I don't treat this patient because I'm more worried about the greater good of bacterial resistance. Uh, I think like most of humanity's actions just do an action for the short term and worry about the long term later. Exactly. And so, I mean, in, in the literature, they, they definitely compare it to, for example, climate change and how, like, the same kind of way. Like, most people, when they go and drive their cars, like, you think about climate change and you can think about your, your impact of the, that little bit of emissions, but it's so little of a change that we do, we all do it anyway, right? And so there, there yes. needs to be, like, a higher level, some kind of infrastructure, whether it be national or international or technical or otherwise, to allow people to work together on that scale. Uh, and this is kind of one of those examples. There's another one like uh, with Earth's uh, synchronous orbit band, uh, where satellites can go in geosynchronous orbit. Mm -hmm. So everyone kept on launching a satellite up into that band, hoping that their actions are going to impact the future. But now you have debris uh, floating around and around Earth that is uh, has a lot of kinetic energy, and so th there being other satellites that are trying to function are being impacted by paint flecks and dust that was from the satellites that are now decommissioned up in space. Right. Or and and it's so now the the geosynchronous orbit band it's becoming crowded, not unusable, but there's there are issues now and 50 years later uh, where it may reach a point where we can't launch any more satellites because there's so much debris out that have to be cleaned up somehow. And not just satellites too, but I mean, conceivably space stations. I know I posted earlier this morning, uh, today's the 49th anniversary of our first uh, space station, the Salyut, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, one space station that the Soviet Union put up. That Because isn't that also in geostationary Earth orbit, or is that not geostationary? Or... I would guess so. Uh, I don't know. I can't tell. Okay. Um, but but, uh, but sure, I was just trying to use an analogy. That's, an, that's another... Go ahead. Oh, no. I was just trying to use an analogy that it's uh, it's another action where we're doing stuff without uh, considering the long-term impact of it. And, but... and for sure, like, af again, after COVID is dealt with, COVID is kind of more of the short-term problem we all have to figure out, which, which is actually kind of another one, too, that, like, people leave their their houses, and then there's kind of a, a level of, of common risk that's involved with interacting with people, going for groceries, etc. There's a level of risk we have to kind of live with, and we, we all kind of do. But anyway, this show is get, starting to be about as long as I'm intending. So now that you have the world's attention, do you have anything you'd like to, to tell the world or uh, anything to get out? I made this close, but uh, we were, like, right now, before the pandemic, we were already doing this cost-benefit analysis of spending my viruses on vaccine research versus saving uh, saving human lives. And now we're reacting to the pandemic. Uh, and the official message is that we need to socially isolate and sacrifice our economy to save lives. So I'm hoping once the pandemic is clear that society remembers that message and not to focus on persistent tax breaks because science funding basically needs the government as an actor and vaccine research definitely doesn't have the for-profit model. No one wants to invent into the, wants to invest into the SARS vaccine, right. which would have maybe helped against the COVID-19 vaccine because it, it was too much money. Now it's a little hypocritical. To, and, and, and even uh, actually specifically, uh, I, I just wa finished watching the uh, event, the Bill and Linda Gates uh, Event Tool One videos. And one of the participants of that, who is there from, uh, is a representative of the banks, but she used to work as part of the Australian government. And she had specifically been trying to get a program off the ground to target bat-related beta coronaviruses and to make a vaccine for them before this event started. Like, this was something she was doing. 
So it was, there were projects on the go that we could have invested in. And that, even if the SARS vaccine hadn't panned out, this was much more targeted to the kind of pandemic that we have wound up having. So, I mean, hindsight is, of course, 2020. But anyway, continue on. But it's kind of like vaccine research is kind of like insurance. Like, you don't say, oh, I'm not, my home isn't going to suffer from a tornado. I'm not going to have any damage to my home. So I better not get ins- uh, by home insurance. It's sometimes you have to do stuff for the long even term. if you can't. Uh, that's oh, yeah. yeah. All right. So that, that, that's um, probably good. Good for now. So thank you very much, Anonymous, for joining me for this close to an hour. And for the rest of you, if you'd like more of this kind of show, uh, definitely go to my subscriber star, uh, subscriberstar.com/jeff-cliff to see more episodes of this show and to maybe throw a dime or so in my direction because. Uh, As mentioned in previous shows, my hours have been cut, so every little bit helps. So, thank you everyone for watching, and I will see you all next week. Just a moment, we're apart.